So here's the idea uh, for this morning, what we're going to do first. Um, I've just been thinking about things a little differently as God's been laying things on my heart and with church. And um, i thinking like, what's the point of this? What's the point of church? What's the point of getting together? Like those kind of questions. Like what, what's the real essence of what we're doing? What's the essence of why we're supposed to meet? Why does God want us to meet in a group? Why does he say, yeah, why does he say to not forsake your fellowship with one another? And then I started reading through the book of Acts, and you know what it always said when the apostle Paul would come and visit a church or when they would do stuff together? You know what it always said? It said they were encouraged. And they left encouraged, or they did something, and it left encouraged. Like when Paul came, they were, all the believers were encouraged. And so like, that's the point. That we become, like, hopefully what we do here is we encourage you to live out what your true identity in God, right? Because you're not going to stand before me on that day. You're not going to stand before anyone else but the Lord, right? And so our, our job is to grow as a family and to encourage each other as in love and in what God has for us, amen? So one of the things I thought about doing this morning that I thought would be fun, because Part of being in a family is building relationships, right? But a lot of us have been also been in families where you don't necessarily build relationships. You check out. Or you've had parents that checked out, right? And and, um, so one of the things I've noticed about relationship building is it's very intentional. You just kind of got to go for it. And it's it's also easy to be unintentional, isn't it? Right? You just kind of talk about the same things, you know, and even as a married couple, uh, I mean, like, if you only get into talking about, like, that day or the tasks of that day, you actually don't grow in relationship. And you stop talking about the heart and the dreams of the person and all of these things, right? And so I just want to encourage us. So one of the things this morning, we're going to break up into groups of three to five. I want you to get into groups of three to five with people that you would not, nor- so not your own family members, all of you guys on this row, all of you guys, you have to break up because of what we're going to do. And I want, we're going to go around and we're going to share our salvation stories with one another. So I want, I just want you, like you, and, and try to like keep, so for some of you that um, like the details, just remember we have other things to do today. <laughs> so you don't have to give the 40-year version of it. All right, but just kind of keep the main details. Like, what drew you to Christ, and why, how did you come to know Jesus, and how did he pursue you to where you had an encounter with him? And, and um, is this making sense? So yeah, so we're going to, right now, we're just going to break up into groups of three to five, just kind of separate around the room, and we're just going to share, just go around one by one and tell everybody in the group how you came to know the Lord. All right, break. Let's go. How many of you found out something totally new about somebody you didn't know that well? Come on. Isn't that fun? Come on. Love hearing how God's working in people's lives in different ways. We're going we're gonna to go into a time of, of worship. Um, hey, Skyler, can you turn the lights down? Just not on the stage, but in the sanctuary there. I think it's the other ones. Yeah. All right. So we're going to just go into a time of worship this morning, Um, and um, I would encourage you guys just to be just thinking about how grateful you are that you came to know Christ, amen, and all that he's done in your life. Um, So we're just going to kind of be responding out of that heart this morning about being thankful for the salvation that God has given us. It is only through the blood of Jesus that there is true salvation offered in this world. Amen? I love it in Isaiah. God says it many times. He says, I am the only one who saves. I am the only one who can save. And I love that, that 
he sought me out. And I know how many of you felt just like you were pursued by God, by his presence. And I love that about our God, that he pursued us. Not that we loved him first, but that he first loved us. Everything that God did was because of love. Amen. It's awesome. So I'm going to have uh, TG. I just totally put him on the spot. But um, I'm going to have TG come up and just play some familiar choruses. So we're not going to have words, but I just want to encourage you, just go ahead and stand this morning, and we're going to kind of just worship the Lord. If you want to walk around, if you want to um, lay on the ground, whatever, we're just going to do, we're going to worship the Lord um, as TG just leads us in some, some uh, choruses this morning. Pull out our 
just uh, bow your, just kind of keep your eyes closed. We're gonna we're gonna do a little spiritual exercise, hearing from the Lord this morning. So just where you're at, we're gonna ask the Lord a question, and I want you to ask the Lord this question with your own mouth, and repeat after me, and then we're gonna just sit here and listen. And I just want to encourage you when the Lord starts speaking to you, if you have like a journal or you can. Try to remember it the best way you can. Um, Because God is, I really feel like God is wanting to speak to us this morning. I know he's wanting to speak and I know he will speak. And so I'm just going to pray a prayer and then we're going to jump into this. In the name of Jesus, I tell every spirit that doesn't bow its knee to the Lordship of Christ to leave this place. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that your presence rules and reigns in this house. And I ask that you would come now and begin releasing the words of the Father over our lives. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, and I thank you that you are going to speak to us, Lord. I pray for his words and pictures to be released in the room in Jesus' name. Amen. So just where you're at, I want you to ask the Lord this question. Just say, Father... What's the most important thing that you want me to know right now? How many of you are here? We're hearing something from the Lord. Sometimes it's like a simple one liner. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I would say in my quiet times in the morning with the Lord, um, these are the kind of things that I try to do because it's way more important for for me to hear from God than for me to talk to God. <laughs> I like talking to God, don't get me wrong, but I'd much rather hear from Him. <laughs> and um, I just want to encourage you guys, like this is something you can do all the time when you spend your time with the Lord in the morning or in the evening or when you can or while you're driving just to ask the Lord these questions and he'll answer you um, so how many of you felt like you heard from the Lord quite a bunch awesome thank you Jesus love that so I encourage you to write that stuff down because you heard from the Lord and it's it's awesome you want to treasure those things um, Sharon Sharon came up to me and she had a, a vision of while we were singing, um, was it Good, Good Father, Sharon? When we were singing Good, Good Father, she said she saw like the choir of angels in heaven singing with us because uh, angels love to glorify the Father. They love singing about the Father. And uh, can we sing that one last time? And she also saw two large jars about this tall and they were filled to the brim and she's like I don't know what it is and I said I felt like when you said that I felt like it was the new wine that God has for us to pour his presence out on us so that's what she saw and I just wanted to share that I feel like God is getting ready to pour out the new wine amen so just stand up with me as a congregation and we're going to sing this chorus one more time and we can, can we sing your perfect, that's like my favorite part. Oh, yeah. You're perfect in all your ways. I could sing that all day. So. <laughs> Let's just sing this together. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
something um just gave me a little bit of a word here so when i was i prayed for it. sharon came in actually hurting pretty bad and we i got to pray with her this morning she got healed instantly thank you lord um but i felt like god just gave me a word of knowledge of something he wants to heal in the room and i feel like i actually feel it's a lot of people so we're going to do a wholesale healing in jesus name but when I, when I say the pain you carry because of the stress in your life, how many of you know you carry pain in certain areas of your body? Like, you, like some people are like, I know, and you know it's from like the stress, right? How many of you, does that make sense too? Yeah. So, and how many of you are feeling that pain right now? Quite a few just stand up right where you're at. And um, I just want you to put your hand on that area of pain the Lord did something to me in my quiet time this week. It was actually yesterday morning, and he said, my, I know that I carry my stress right here. Like my upper neck gets really tense, and, my, and I, I can get like that sometimes if I'm... And the Lord said, the pain, he told me, he goes, Justin, the pain in your, your neck is, shows where you're believing lies about your sonship. And you're putting yourself in that area of the throne and that's why the stress builds up <laughs> and I just want to encourage you right now so he said I want you to release that to me and tell me like I want you to put your trust fully back in me and put me in that place and watch that pain leave your body right now and I, I did that and I just felt this peace come over my body and it left so I just want to encourage you just like right where you're at just like Lord show me where I have believed a lie or believed that something and he'll, he'll show you like what it is like whether it's man i'm maybe i'm you're putting trust in yourself and not trusting god in your finances or trusting him in some other way or thinking i have to do this i have to get this done and god's like no put that on me and watch that pain leave your body do that just close your eyes if you're having that pain just imagine that right now just imagine him knocking on the door you know what the good thing about Jesus coming over is? Something's about to shift. So, <laughs> so just, yeah, picture that in your mind. Lord, we just open that door to you this morning. We can't do it on our own, Jesus. We can't do it without you, and you won't do it without us. Come in. We invite you in. And the peace that surpasses all understanding is now coming on your body right now in Jesus' name. Peace of God, wash. Wash over us this morning.
Thank you, Jesus. How many of you are feeling that peace coming on your body right now? Just wave your hand at me. I just want to see what, yeah, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we thank you. I release the justice of heaven in this room right now. What you paid for by your stripes, we are healed. And let the peace that surpasses understanding guard us, encircle us, wrap us up in your love and your peace right now. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Ministering angels, come and just release that peace over bodies right now. In Jesus' name, running down the spine. We call pinched nerves to be unpinched in Jesus' name. Peace. We speak peace. Go into peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So Paul said to give two or three words, right? We gave eight, so we, um, but yeah, definitely hit it. It's fun to, uh, to step out and do those kind of things, and one of the things that I'm hoping you guys begin to realize as you're a part of this family is that God is speaking to you all the time, that he's laying things on your heart all the time, that he's speaking to your imagination, like he's in your imagination all the time. Um, and that you start noticing that, like when you have, when you're around a person at Walmart or, or you know, anywhere, restaurants or whatever you're doing, your own job, and you sense something just randomly, it's probably the Lord, right? Especially when you sense something encouraging for that person. And, and it'll, you know, people, one thing I have noticed about giving words to people is they're just so hungry right now. They're hungry in our world. Um, Jesus, I think when he said, look, remember when he said, told the disciples, look around you. The fields are white with harvest. It's ready, right? It's ready for the harvest. I don't think that's changed. It's still right. People are still crying out. Everyone who's been born a son of God and doesn't know that yet, their inner man is crying out for that. And they're fulfilling it in a lot of other ways, a lot of them, and it's bringing emptiness. And it causes hunger. It causes more crying out deep within. Because when you're created for freedom and you walk in bondage, something has to shift, right? And um, so that's why I feel like people are just hungry for this. And our job, like what I talked about leaving last week, remember making the mountains low, the valleys bringing them up, getting rid of the rough places? These prophetic, a prophetic gifting is, it, it enables a lot of times, someone to be able to see what God has for them. It speaks to the heart of who they are and calls them to their destiny. It speaks to the, a lot of times, it speaks to the, the season of life they're in now and gives them the courage to keep going. Because one thing I do know about the Lord is he's not about making things easy for me. He's about doing what's best for me. Amen? Amen? And like I was thinking about like that word Aaron just gave about, you know, being all cut up, right, Sean? Like God, like there's just, there is, like there is a tenacity that it takes to go after and get everything that God has for you. Amen? Like there's a tenacity that it takes. There's a, there is a purposeful going after something. It's, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, not a rewarder of those who, who don't really care. Or a rewarder of those who just sit on their butt and hope something's going to fall on their lap one day. Like, there is a diligently seeking, but that, what I've noticed is that the diligently seeking comes from encounter. The more I encounter him, the more I want to diligently seek him because I actually know how good he is. Amen? And so part, I mean, the part about being in a body of believers is there should be a culture of the prophetic all the time here. Right? And that's what we, we really want to start raising up in this body is because, like, we all go through hard stuff in life. Marriage is not easy. 
Raising kids is not easy, right? Your job with people who are all wounded and dealing with them is not easy, right? All of these things in life, and we go through hard seasons. We get tempted by stuff. We get um, attacked by things, and we're like, we need one another to come alongside and give us the encouraging word, like, oh, oh, thank you. I was staring at the ground for a while. Thank you for raising my head again to keep my eyes on where I'm headed, where I'm going. Amen? Like, because there's times, I mean, how many of you have walked through the ebbs and flows of life? You know, you get into these gullies and you're like, oh, and you're like, you're down in here and you're like, oh, and then your friend raises that valley up for you. Amen? Come on, brother, let's go. That's not who you are. Amen? So I want to, I want to, so with that foundation, uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What time is it? <laughs> if you get done before I do, feel free to leave. Um, that's how we work here. Just don't fall asleep and fall out of a window. Luckily, we don't have any, so it should be good. <laughs> See, even a lot of you would be like, I would love to hear the Apostle Paul, but he was pretty long-winded, it sounds like. I mean, if you're preaching and someone dies, <laughs> might take that personally. So you guys know that story, or you, some of you are looking at me like, what is he talking about? When Paul was preaching one time, a kid fell asleep and fell out of a window. So he was, must have been really exciting, that kid. Um, but he fell out of the window and died, and he was laying still, and all the believers got around him and raised him from the dead. And bam, there you go. Let's keep preaching. All right. <laughs> all right, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I didn't turn there. I have a bad habit of that. All right. One of the things that I really felt God lay on my heart is that unity is probably one of the most important things to him. That as a family, that at the heart of love is, is a heart of unity and going after the same things. Now, unity, here's what, unity does not mean this. Unity does not mean perfect agreement. Okay. Like in a marriage relationship or anything like that, you know, your the marriage relationship's the easiest one because God says, and the two shall become one, right? So there is a unifying that's supposed to take place between a man and a wife, and you give your yourselves to that person wholly and wholeheartedly. But there are still differences in agreement. There's still differences in opinion. If any of you have noticed that. You still think completely differently, but the beauty of it is that when, you, when honor is at the center of the relationship, then you two people can truly become one and grow together, and you're able to see the world from a completely different perspective when you honor. Amen? And so, but that should also, that should also transfer into this setting. Like where Paul talks about, there's many parts of the body, right? We don't all do the same stuff. We're not all called to the same thing. If the, you know, he talks about it. If the eye were to say to the hand, I don't need you, how's that going to work out? Right? Now, but if one part suffers, it all suffers. And so there is that side of things. Like we aren't all called to the same things, but we are called to honor what other people are called to. And realize that, hey, I don't have this gifting necessarily, but this person does. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn and grow from them in this gifting. Amen? Like, and it's not, it's not, doesn't, his analogy doesn't perfectly coincide with the body, but he, de, it's funny how he talks about that analogy, and then he goes into the spiritual giftings in his letter in the Corinthians, right? And then he goes into love, and then he goes into prophecy. So he's, he's saying like, hey, he gives the analogy of the body parts, and then he's like, here's all the different spiritual giftings. And then he says, zealously go after these things, right? But at the center of it, keep love, let love be the, the thing that drives you. And see, love, the, the essence to me about love that is so important is it is selfless. 
I think that's one of the, like, if you get that part about love, I think you could spend your whole life there. Because if you're selfless, you will, you will always walk in unity with others. Right? Because you're not worried about your own needs getting met. You're worried about meeting other people's needs. You're worried about being the answer, not getting, not always taking. You're worried about, hey, God, how do you want to use me to give to this person? I want to help this person out. I want to do what's best for them. You know what happens when everybody does that? Do you know what happens when a man and a wife do that? But if one of them is all about their own dreams and their own desires, how does that work? Do they actually become one? No. And God's been, like, really dealing with me on that because, like, you're raised, like, there's, there's a balance. It's weird in the kingdom because we all want to do what God has for us, right? But when you're single, you kind of get that, that focus of it's about me and what I'm going to accomplish with my life. And then you get married and you're like, oh, it's not. <laughs> That's not actually the most important thing to God right now. Like, and he keeps showing me, he's like, Justin, as a father, you should be more worried and more, like, not worried, but more focused on releasing what you're into your kids, what their, goal, what their goals are, and what my dreams are for them, than for seeking after your own dreams, because that's what a father does. It's like, and I'm like, God, what do you mean? I'm not supposed to worry about my own calling? No. Because if you go after seeking, if you're a spiritual father and you're going after all of these people's dreams and helping them grow and releasing them, guess what? You are fulfilling what I have for you. <laughs> so it's just interesting, like how God, like the, how many of you heard the term the upside down kingdom of heaven? Like God's upside down. He does everything backwards. Oh, you want to go after your dreams? Then don't worry about it. Go after, actually help someone else be released in their dream and then you'll get yours. Amen? Like, it's, it's different. But does the world tell you to do that? No. They're like, it's all about individualism. You go after your own. Like, how is that done for relationships? All right. It's because the world is stupid. God says it. The wisdom of the world is foolishness to God, and the wisdom of God is stupid foolishness to the world. They don't get it. And you don't get it either until he renews your mind. All right. So here, for verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Um, the other version's delete or don't have into in there. So we've all been made to drink in, in one spirit or of one spirit. So we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So we were baptized into one spirit. We were baptized into one kingdom of God. Even though there's a bunch of different giftings of the spirit and all of those things, it's the same spirit that gives the giftings of each to each one, right? And so in this, we also have to remember that we have brothers and sisters that go to different churches that are still brothers and sisters, right? And we're called to walk in unity with them. We're not called to be the theology police, okay? Okay? We're called to love them and help them be released in their giftings and callings as well. However, God calls us to do that. Amen? Amen? And obviously, you know, I think there's different churches for a reason. There's a practical side that, you, you know, you have your immediate family and then you have extended family. And that's kind of how I look at it. It's like we have our immediate family where we're born into this family. Or we like, I'm going to be a part of this family. But then there is the extended family. Some of them are crazy uncles. But... At least we think they are, but then they think we're the crazy uncle. <laughs> or whatever it is, you know. There, there's always those kind of things going on. But our job is to walk in unity with them and to honor what they do carry, not always point out what they don't. And vice versa. Like, how would the body of Christ be if we honored what they did carry and not only talk about what they didn't?
I mean, just think about how encouraged you would feel if your spouse only pointed out on what you did bad. Or your kids, if you only tell them what they're doing wrong, how does that help them grow? Right? So you think about those kind of things. Like there's a kingdom perspective and there's a worldly perspective. Everything about the kingdom of heaven builds you up, not tear you down. Everything about the kingdom of heaven tell, speaks into your true identity in God. It doesn't steal from it. Everything about the kingdom of heaven is completely getting rid of fear in every area of your life. Because love casts out all fear. Therefore, if fear is speaking, if fear is driving you, if fear is, fear is what causes us to do so many things out of, outside of the kingdom of heaven. Fear, shame, guilt, all of these kind of things are things not of the kingdom of heaven. And so as, bo- as a body of believers, like, we have to be careful. Like, am I walking out of fear towards this person and therefore putting shame on them or guilt? Is this making sense? Yeah. So how do, how do we learn how to walk in unity there? And it doesn't mean that you don't, there's not confrontation but there's a different kind of confrontation in the kingdom of heaven than in the world. Right? Because confrontation in the kingdom of heaven looks like, hey, man, I'm seeing this going on in your life. And that's not, I don't believe that's who you're called to be. Right? It's trying to get them out of the pit, not stepping on them while they're in the pit. You know, um, that's a good example of this. You know, when you speak, when someone's struggling with a sin or some area of their life, the actual sin is not the action. The sin is the, the wrong belief in their identity. That's missing the mark of what God has for them. And when you have a wrong belief in your identity, the actions from that place of belief, wrong belief is what leads to the, the fruit, so to speak, right? So, like, Whatever it might be, drinking too much, pornography, overeating, I don't know, um, pick, pick your poison, drugs, painkillers, all of these kind of things that, that people run to, that is actually not at all the issue. There is a false belief in their identity somewhere, and that is how they're trying to fulfill that pain. That's how they're trying to fulfill or solve the problem of the fear in their life, or solve the problem of the guilt in their life, or solve the problem of the shame in their life. And our job is not to help that shame. (laughs) Okay? So our job is to hear from heaven, like prophetically, and say, what do you have for this person, God? What are you calling them? How do you see them? Because it's so crazy. Like every time I have ever gone to God and apologized for some sin issue that I thought was a huge deal, he most of the time ignores it. What I've noticed, I'm like, why is this not important to you? And then finally he's like, because that's not the actual problem. It's like if you actually believed that you are in my righteousness, you are a son of God, chosen and destined to change the world and to be a light carrier for all eternity. If you believed all these things that my blood paid for you, you would have no issue. That, that sin would not even like, it wouldn't even look tempting at all. Is this making sense to you guys? And so like, I just think about it. Like, I remember like, I've always been really open with my wife, and I've been open with you guys about my struggle with pornography over the years. And then we, I got to share with you a really cool breakthrough I had when I did inner healing in front of the whole church, um, <laughs> which was embarrassing a little bit, but God, you know, he's good. Um, he told me that night, if you'll be brave with this, I have something for you. And I'm like, oh, Lord, am I going to be open in front of this many people? Right? And then that's, the, the, that's when fear starts talking, right? What does the voice of fear say? If you're vulnerable, they'll judge you. They're going to all lose respect for you if you're open. They're going to, you're going to, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. Right? And that's the same voice that he, he says God is thinking about you. Oh, you messed up. God doesn't want to hear from you right now. He is so disappointed in you. He is looking, oh man. Like, you recognize that voice? That's fear. 
That's shame. That's guilt. Like, that's the thing keeping you from those things. And when we walk in fear, shame, and guilt in and of ourselves, that's also what we give others. And that's why God wants to set us free. Because we can't be in unity if we're walking in the wrong spirit. We can't walk in unity if we're carrying fear, shame, and guilt ourselves. Because no matter how much you try to quote the Bible, it'll come through that lens because it's what you believe about yourself. And it mostly comes to those who are closest to you because you're not as, a, as easily able to hide it from those. Does that make sense? Like you can act like a good Christian on Sunday. Right? You can. It's a lot easier. Like I have a lot. It's way easier for me to have grace for people that I'm not with all day long. The people that get hurt the most from the fear, guilt, and shame that I've partnered with are my wife and my kids. Because if I have a view of unworthiness of myself, can I impart worthiness to my child? That's hitting hard, isn't it? You know, this is making, I hope, like, hope this is hitting. If I grab hold of unworthiness. And so, like, some of you, some of you are, you know, like, wondering, like, why am I struggling with these things? I promise you, it has, it has to do with three things. It has to do with either fear, guilt, or shame in your life. Everything you struggle with, every false comfort that you run into, it has to do with lies of fear, guilt, and shame in your life somewhere. Were you... And like, because God's dealing with this with me. He's like, it's like, what's the answer? How do I get rid of this? He's like, believe what I said about you. Believe what I say about you now. Believe what Jesus did on the cross for you. All right, go to First John real quick. For this reason, the Son of God was made manifest. First John. It's right before Second John. <laughs> Two books before Third John. <laughs> before Revelation and after Genesis. Somewhere in there. Next, I'm going to tell you to turn to Hezekiah and see how many people go. Uh, first John chapter 4. Yeah, I got distracted. There's a rabbit trail. Just remember, if you're only free after you die, then death's your savior, not Jesus. So just keep that in mind, because the amount of freedom that God has for you to walk in right now is the same amount of freedom that I believe he has for you to walk in in heaven. Either that or Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough. All right, so verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 8 was the one I quoted. It's, um, that's not what I want to read right now. Go to First John chapter 4, but it says, For this reason the Son of God was made manifest, that, that he would destroy the works of the enemy. What's the enemy the father of? Lies. Lies, right? So his destroying, like when everything Jesus did destroyed the works of the enemy. Did Jesus focus on the enemy? No, how much do you hear about, oh, I'm worried about the spirit that is reigning over this town in Jesus' speech? He didn't care. I'm going to go do what the Father's telling me to do, and I'm going to destroy everything in my path that the enemy's trying to do. I don't have to focus on what the enemy's doing. I'm going to focus on what the Father's doing, and when I release his work, it destroys the works of the enemy. Yes. Period. Right? Unless, I mean, I just, that's how I view things. That's how I view spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not trying to go after the enemy. The spiritual warfare is going after the king of kings and the lord of lords, and the enemy dies in the wake. When Jesus said, I only do what I see the father doing, I only try to fight what I see the enemy doing. Did he say that? No, he doesn't say that. I only do what I see the Father doing. What we have to understand is the God of peace will soon crush Satan. So when you carry peace, you crush Satan under your feet. You don't have to go looking for him. He just gets crushed. 
Because he can't, he can't handle the Prince of Peace. Peace is the destroyer of chaos. The Spirit of God in my life, if I come in full of light and I step into a room, it's my room. I don't care how dark the room is. It's my room because Jesus lives inside of me. And it's not like me trying to be cocky. It's going, if something, if he lives inside of me, something does have to shift, right? Like there is no spirit that can come against me that can trump the Jesus in me. Yeah. If I believe that, right? And God, I mean, there are things like, there's times when you want to go after something and God's like, hold on, you're not ready yet. How many of you have ever felt that? You know, there was a, I remember when I was in Bali, they had this crazy Hindu ceremony up in the mountains, and me and my brother-in-law were like, let's go to that. And God's like, we both felt like God's like, nope, <laughs> you're not quite ready for that yet, but you will be. And so he's like, okay, like, all right, like, I will listen to that, Lord. Um, all right, go to First John chapter 4, we there? How you guys doing? I'm already talking too long, aren't I? Is anyone falling out of a window? No? Okay, so. All right. I love this. Belo verse 7. Beloved. I love how John talks. He's such a father. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You could focus on that for a little bit. All right. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us. You guys know what manifested means? Is it, it just means revealed. Something hidden that has now been revealed. That's what manifest means. It, you know, if I manifest my heart towards you, I let you see my heart by me telling you what's going on inside of me. I manifest my thoughts to you. I'm telling you, my inner monologue becomes outer monologue, right? All right, so in this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, propitiation is it's expiatory death. It means that he, the propitiation for our sins was like the price that was needed to pay for sins was done with Jesus taking our place. Expiatory, that's what that means. It's a Christianese word, but it's, it means literally like, I was on the chopping block. I deserve death because of the sins that I had committed. And you were, we were all in the same place. But Jesus came in and he pardoned us. He took the book that the enemy had with all of our mistakes, all of our sins, all of our junk, all of our false beliefs, and he took that and he took it all away from the end, out of the enemy's hands and burned it and took our place and died in our stead. And in Colossians, it talks about that, that he took care of everything that was handwritten against us that the enemy had. So he sent his only son to die in our stead or to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, if he was willing to do that for us, we also ought to love one another. How many of you have ever been in an argument with your spouse? How many of you understand from being married that winning an argument doesn't mean you win. Right? Or even with your, your friends, close friends. You don't have to be married for this. Close friends, you get in a big fight and you prove them wrong and you're right. How's the relationship doing? Right? Like, you know, and then, you know, so those kind of things. Like, you can win something but not actually win. And, and I think this is what God thinks. He's like, yeah, Justin, you can actually be right about the gospel message, but it can be destroying a brother. Is that making sense? Like, you can think, well, I'm further along in my spiritual walk because I want to believe in healing. And I walk in the prophetic to you, young man. You know, or whatever. You know, like, there's things that, 
we can use our spiritual giftings. And other, there's, there's brothers and sisters that don't even believe that it's available. Right? So is our job to tell them how dumb they are? <laughs> or is our job to bring an encounter of love to them that calls them to a higher place? And it calls us to a higher place. Amen? I just feel like there's a different approach in the kingdom of heaven that God is trying to lead us to if we really want to walk in unity. And we're going to have to learn, like, God's not as near as important to him about being right as it is about loving somebody. He's not about, he doesn't care near as much about your perfect theology or your perfect teaching points as he does, do you love your brother? Are you loving that person into a deeper encounter with me? Are you loving that person into a, a greater walk with me, into them being released into a, great, a greater revelation of who they are as a son and a daughter of God? That's a good question. All right, so uh, verse 13. By this we know we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. Oh! What? Did you read that? Because this should never get old. Like, I, I have to remind myself, because when you read Scripture, like, over and over again, you, you really do need to stop and say, is this really saying this? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God himself abides in him. And he, and he, in God. What does that look like? What can it look like? <laughs> that God is in me and I am in him, period. This is state of identity right here. It's not a question of if. If you confess Jesus as Lord, you are in him and he is in you, period. Now, what you choose to do with that, what, how you choose to partner with the truth that comes because of that relationship is between you and him. Amen? And some people, I don't know, I see, it does seem to me like some people only get a small sliver of the pie, but they're still brothers and sisters. Amen? And one thing I have noticed is that, I mean, I mean, you know these guys on TV that love, they're really good at arguing? You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? Like these kind of people, like, or on news things, or it's, I mean, how many of you have ever seen, like, you know, the liberals and the conservatives arguing with each other, right? And they're like, I mean, just going to town, right? And at the end of it, you're always like, I feel so good from watching that. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is great. This is great entertainment. <laughs> I mean, it's like, does any, of them, does any of them just go, huh, you're smarter than me. I like your opinion. <laughs> Have you ever seen that happen? It definitely, it happens all the time on Facebook, though. When I mean, people argue on Facebook, I mean, every time you're like, the other person's always like, no, oh, I'm so sorry. I see your point. You're so right. I'm being sarcastic because it never happens. And it's just kind of like you think about this. It's like our world is like built on this, this kind of concept. And it's, it does leak into the church. And we have to remember what's actually valuable to the kingdom of heaven. Amen? To love one another into your calling. To love one another into their identities. To look past the weaknesses of your brother. To cover one's weakness and to lift them in their strength. Amen? I mean, I don't know. There's, there's good analogies like weightlifting. You know, there's, have you ever seen these guys that work out really hard, but they forget to work out one part of their body? <laughs> right? It's usually leg day. Yeah, it's leg day. Nobody likes leg day. There's not, not many people like leg day anyway. Because one of the issues of working out your legs is when you start working out your legs, you know what happens when you work out muscles? Blood gets pumped to those muscles, right? 
So all that blood flow is going next to your stomach, and that's why people feel like stomach aches when they're like doing hard like squats and doing all these lunges and stuff like that. But then you see these guys that don't like to work out their legs, and they're like jacked up top, and then they got the tiny little chick legs, <laughs> right? And it actually, because of that, it'll make it so their upper body won't grow anymore unless they take fake stuff that your body shouldn't have in it. Right? You know what I'm saying? Because your body's like, hey, you're disproportioned. <laughs> so our job is to come alongside our brothers and be like, hey, this is awesome. You're so good at this. It's like, what are, you want, let's work out your legs. Let's do a leg workout together. Is this making sense? Like, I want to help you along here. I've just noticed, like, hey, you're really good at this. And I'm going to, how do you, how do you get your pecs to do that? <laughs> or, I don't know. <laughs> All right. How do, you, how do you do that? You know, have you ever seen The Rock? He makes his, like, anyway. Um, I mean, he's, he's ginormous, but, so, but you're like, how do you do that? Like, I've seen, like, you're really strong in this theory. Can you show me how you work out in this way? And then you're, you're the one, you got, you got really good legs or whatever, and you're like, hey, I, I can show you legs if you want. You know, that's, we come alongside, we're like, come on, encouraging one another. Like, hey, let's go, let's go. Hey, I know you like really love to, to go for the Lord and step out here, but um, you're also kind of like harsh a little bit. Like, I'm gonna, what about being a shepherd too? Right? Is it, this is where we grow. We, we all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. We are, our job is to help cover one as we, each other's weaknesses and to release them in their strengths, to learn from one another's strengths because Lucas's strengths are not necessarily my strengths, right? So if I honor his strength, I'll actually grow in what isn't my strength, which if it's not my strength, it's my... So me honoring his strength helps me grow in my weakness. All right, I'm going to stop with one other thing. You guys doing all right with me? I, I'm... I love preaching, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> What's we? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal the mic from him. I just, I'm sitting because I want to sit. Okay, I'll stand. Um, hi. Uh, he was just talking about, and the Lord literally just laid it on my heart. And Justin has a really good message about this. He could, well, I just got lightheaded. Uh, I stood up way too fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw Justin. He works his legs. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to have a new ministry in this church. It's going to be called Leg Day. And everyone's going to be like, this is where we exchange our strengths and weaknesses. Um, anyway, oh my gosh, please let me talk. I, I just lose my place and it's not good. Okay. I was thinking about a story in the Bible. Let's do a pop quiz here. There's a story in the Bible, and it's a really important story, and it's about a man who had sons. And two of them didn't cover their father's weakness, and one of them did. Does anyone know what story I'm talking about? Noah. The son that covered his father's weakness was a mighty nation, right? The sons that didn't, what happened? They got cursed. Like, I'm not talking about ble like blessings and curses right here, but when you were talking about that, I just felt like the Lord was like, we have an opportunity um, when we honor each other and we cover each other's weaknesses. It doesn't mean we enable people, but we have an opportunity to change a nation. One son. One son who chose honor. <laughs> like, I just feel the weightiness of that. Like, when I was sitting there, I was like, whoa. I have an opportunity to change my family's generation by covering and just go there in your mind right now. Think about that thing. Jesus said, I did it. I covered in blood. I just feel like the weightiness of God just wants to say, I've called you to change a nation. And it starts with whatever it is, whatever weakness is in front of you, you feel God is calling you into to cover. That's powerful. Thank you, sweetie. Yeah, I think 
I mean, as you're saying that, I think of, you know, the people that had a great impact on even ungodly leadership, like a Daniel and like a Joseph. That they were willing to serve ungodly leaders. And because of that, God wrecked and changed that whole nation. And Nebuchadnezzar became a Christian. Now, they didn't have Christians back then, right, because Jesus wasn't there. But he came to believe in the one true God of Daniel. Amen? Because he was willing to walk in someone else and serve someone else's vision, even if it wasn't necessarily godly. But he carried the kingdom where he went. All right, I want to... Um, I'm going to finish with this one thing here. We're going to study in the book of Acts here a little bit. We're going to jump around a bit. So go to Acts chapter 1. Verse 4. I'm going to read fast, so try to stay with me. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Who is he? Jesus. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. And he talks about that in John 14, 15, and 16, the promise of the Holy Spirit that was going to come. He said, he is with you now, and later he will be in you. That's what he's talking about. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, or for us, not many chapters from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, we, obviously, that's an awesome verse, but we're not, I'm not focusing on that specifically today. Um, receiving power is amazing, right, from the Holy Spirit. So verse 9, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, and as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath stage journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus. I'm trying to get through the name. <laughs> and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. All right, I'm going to, what we're going to notice here is what happens when people of God do stuff with one accord. There's multiple times in this, in, in Acts, where it talks about with one accord. So the first thing that happens, go to chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Did they always agree on everything? No, so that's not what this is talking about. It's, it's going after the same thing and learning to, like, we're going to have differences of opinion as we go after the spirit, as we want to grow in the spirit and go after these spiritual giftings. There's going to be things that people do that you don't necessarily agree with or don't understand, right, in this journey. But we have to come together in one accord and say, all right, what's the heart behind this? Are we still going after the core value? Is Jesus still the number one goal? Amen? Is he still the plumb line of what we're going after? And then we work on that together, and we have those discussions. Amen? And with one accord, and suddenly, everyone say suddenly. There came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then they appeared with tongues of fire, and... Uh, at the period of tongues of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all, everyone say all. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues and the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then a bunch of people thought they were drunk, right? And then Peter stands up and is like, hey, these men aren't drunk. It's only 10 a.m. We haven't gotten started yet, right? So he's like, hey, we don't drink at 10 a.m. here, but... This is the promise gift of the Holy Spirit and the prophet, as the prophet Joel talks about, right? And then 3,000 people get saved. 
So I want you, what I want to notice, I want you guys to notice is the, um, the powerful breakthroughs that happen after these one accords. All right, so f- the first one accord is probably one of the most powerful ones ever, the day of Pentecost. That as one accord, what were they doing? They're like, I, they were with one accord, sitting in a room, praying and encouraging one another to keep going after the gift that Jesus had promised, which was about a 50-day period of time, I believe, from, um, from when Jesus died to when Pentecost, right? Was it 50? Yeah, 50 days. So they're like, so you got to think about that. Like they're there. All they know is that we're supposed to get this gift of the Holy Spirit. Did they know exactly how it was going to happen? No, they didn't. They didn't know how God was going to show up. They didn't know that they would be speaking in tongues. They didn't know exactly what was going to happen. It doesn't ever, from what I've noticed, it doesn't ever say that Jesus spoke in tongues. Not that I know of from the Gospels. I haven't read that specifically. Now, do I believe he did? Yeah, I do. But it doesn't say that he did. So how would they know? How, I mean, what if he didn't? And they started speaking in tongues going, what's this? This can't be God. I don't understand this. Right? But they, this the way God moved in them. Okay, now jump to verse 22. And this is where Peter's talking. He's still preaching. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. And then go jump to verse 33. Therefore, that man, Jesus, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. All right, now jump over with me to um, verse 38. So Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That means the removal, getting rid of sins. He solved that problem. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. I want to encourage you. This is one thing we are going after because this is the promise that God says is for us and he wants to give it to us. Amen? Has God called you? Yes, then the Holy Spirit, gift of the Holy Spirit is for you. In verse 41, it says that 3,000 souls were add, added to them. Now, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. That's called doing life together, right there. They're just doing life together. They're hanging out, they're talking, they're teaching, they're learning ideas, they're breaking bread, which means they're just eating together and they're praying together. Verse 43, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. This is not the fear, you know, it says perfect love casts out fear. This fear is like that reverential awe, like awe of God came upon them because of the signs and wonders. Like when God is among you, you don't have trouble having the fear of the Lord in your life. Like when you see the miraculous happen right in front of you, you don't have trouble fearing the Lord because you're like, oh my gosh, he's so awesome. Right? It's When you walk in religion your whole life and never see the power of God, you can only talk about the fear of the Lord. You can't actually walk in it. So, verse 46. So, continuing how often? Daily. Sometimes I'm a little jealous of this. Like, I wonder what life looked like with them. You know, like daily, just breaking bread, praying together. Like, obviously, they didn't all... I mean, there's... 3,000 of them at this point. They all weren't all meeting in the same house. They break, I mean, so they were just obviously like in these small groups or whatever, all over the city, just praying together, getting together, like talking together, like all this kind of stuff, being a family together. So continuing daily with one accord. Everyone say with one accord. In the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. All right. Now jump over to chapter, well, I mean, chapter three is awesome, but um, I do want to notice one thing here. In verse six, you guys know this story of Peter where he walks by the lame man? And what did the lame man ask Peter for? Silver and gold. So in verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. Like, when I read this, you can't read this and it doesn't challenge you. you. You can't read this and go, do I pray for people in that level of faith? He's not asking God. Did he ask God to heal him? I mean, just think about like how we go about some of that stuff. Like when we pray for healing, we're like, God, please, please heal this person. You know, a lot of the time are we, our prayers might sound that way. I pray, please show up because I don't really think you are going to. So please show up. And here's Peter going, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, if it be God's will, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up, get up, and walk. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Not if it be God's will, not, oh, please, Lord, please show up right now. No, he commanded it. Okay, you know who he learned that from? Jesus! Jesus never asked God to heal people. He had already spent time with God and knew that God wanted to do it. He didn't have to ask his permission because he already knew what he wanted. He was doing it. Amen? There's a difference. There is a, 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 just a, that relationship there. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now, I'm wondering if you know, he says this, and then we don't, we don't get the perfect timeline here, okay? Like he says this, get up and walk, and we don't know if the guy just went, huh? So maybe he's like, okay, he's not getting the picture. Give me your hand. <laughs> right? Like, it says, all right, Peter, then he's like, all right, I took, he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, how many of us might have the faith to command, but then how many of you have the faith to do the second step? And she's like, dude, get up. That's tough, because we've done it probably, and maybe some of us have done it and not seen it happen. You know, it's tough. It's coming, yeah. But do you really know that you actually do have that inside of you, like Peter knew? What I do have, I give you. Is that cocky of Peter? Is that blasphemy of Peter? No, I'm only saying what, I, what God says he's given me. It's not in and of myself. I'm not healer, but what I have to partner with what he says is inside of me. And I have to keep going for it, amen? And if he asks me to step out, I want to just be obedient in that. Because I get to help make a crooked place straight for a person. I get to help make a mountain a highway for a person. I get to make a desert an interstate for a person to get to God. Amen? All right. So jump over to chapter 4, verse 24. All right, so Peter and John get arrested in chapter 4 um, for, for healing the lame man. And then Peter talks to them, and the, all of the religious leaders who arrested them were like, man, these people must have been with Jesus. They're really different. <laughs> and so they can't hold them because they're like, well, the guy actually got healed. All the people saw that he got healed, so we have to let you go. And so in verse 23... And being let go, they went to their own companions or their church, their own companions. So they went back to all the people they were breaking bread with and being one accord with, right? 
and reported all what the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So here's, here's another thing that happens. Like when you pray with one accord, I've been asking for this for a long time, that what, is it, what would it be like to pray in a prayer meeting where the whole place shook? You know, what would that be like? I remember I did get to see one time when I was in Indonesia, we were in that small little village, and I invited the Holy Spirit. I did hear the the rushing wind of heaven. And then God broke out, and I, we saw tons of people get uh, healed. We saw, I don't know, it's hard to keep track, but um, we were seeing probably 80 people got healed in that whole time. In the three days we were there, and 200 people plus got saved. Um, but yeah, and it all started when we were, we were in this building together, and I looked up to heaven, and I just invited the Holy Spirit, and I just waited. And all of a sudden, I heard it, and it sounded, to me, it sounded like, um, it sounded like a helicopter that was, like, multiple helicopters just flying over the building. It was like, uh, and it's the only time, and I looked around going, am I really hearing this? And I actually literally thought helicopters were actually flying over the building, because I, I mean, I'm like, where's this sound coming from? And it was just like, <laughs> and they started going faster and faster. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And then I'm like, oh. there's like, ding, ding, ding. That's the sound of heaven, like the rushing wind. I said, that's so cool. And then all of a sudden we, and then I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? What are you trying to tell me, God? And only like three or four other people heard it. No one else heard it. I was like, Scotty, my brother-in-law was with me. I'm like, did you hear that? And he's like, hear what? It's like, you didn't hear like the helicopters flying over? He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then I started doubting myself. And I'm like, no, you heard it. It was so loud. And then we found a couple other Indonesians that were like, did you hear that sound? I was like, yes, I did. But anyway, I was like, God, what are you, what are you telling me? He's like, I want you to go after healing. I'm here. And so we went after healing. People just started getting healed. And I'm saying when we walk with one accord, see, what they were asking, when they're talking about these, these verses that we read about what they were praying for, this is what they were in one accord with. You hear me? Like, this is what they're going for. That grant us with all boldness that we may speak your word, God. Stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders would be done through your, the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when we go after those things together, I do believe we will see the place shaken. We will see, we will all be filled with the Holy Spirit. They were already filled, right? We just read that they were already all filled. And then right here it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. Amen? And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now go to verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Isn't that cool? What does that look like? One heart and one soul. I'm going to have to study that one because that one still gets me. To be one in soul with somebody, to, to treasure and to value someone else's emotional being. Neither did anyone say that any of their things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. When we walk, how many of you want great grace to be upon you? (laughs) When we learn to walk with one heart and one soul, protecting one another, treasuring one another, valuing one another, great grace will be upon us all. All right, jump over and one more to verse, uh, chapter 5 of verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. This is talking about the other people that were at the temple that weren't Christians yet. They didn't dare join them, but they esteemed them highly. And the believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitude of both men and women. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. You stand up with me this morning. All right. Jesus, we just thank you that you are teaching us and bringing us to a place of being in one accord. Lord, I pray that uh, unity would just be at the heart of all that we do that your love would actually be at the heart, which would produce unity. Lord, and we, I pray right now, Father, that you would just do a work in each and every one of our hearts, Lord, that we would gain kingdom perspective, kingdom love, and how that we would love others as you have loved us. Lord, and that we would teach us in this thing called love. You would teach us in what kingdom love, what your love really looks like, the selfless love of God. Lord Jesus, and that even our heart's desires, that we would lay those down to help see someone else's heart's desire come true. And Lord, I just pray that you would do this work in us in the name of Jesus. Amen.